Okay, great. Good morning. Um, my name is Dion Edwards. I am your facilitator for today. This is Solved Workshop on uh, Supporting Students with Disability. Uh, so if that's what you registered for, you are in the right room. Okay, and our uh, focus for today is on developing inclusive, inclusive learning environments for students with disabilities. So good morning to everybody. I'm sure everybody's happy because you're home today. You are not in the school building, uh, but today we are, for the next hour, going to engage in professional learning. This is a time when you fill up so that you're able to give out to students. So I'm just admitting a couple more people into the room, um, but definitely uh, this is part of a module of courses that have been offered by Solved over the past few weeks. So feel free um, today to join the other workshops that are happening, um, and those will in include um, teaching uh, high leverage practices for uh, students in teaching students with disabilities. Um, and then we're gonna also talk about how to create accessible learning environments for students. And so if you're unable to make the other workshops today, um, Solve have a, a number of workshops and certainly um, you can catch uh, courses A, B, and C um, by just signing up. So welcome, welcome to everybody. I'm gonna get started in the with our workshop in the interest of time time um, because that is a huge factor with everyone today. So again, welcome everyone. Um, and again, my name is Dion Edwards. Uh, just a little bit about me. I am committed to education because I think it's the best gift that we can give students, right? If we can invest in our society, the best way to do it is to educate our students, our youngsters. And so I've committed myself to doing that for the last 29 years as a teacher, assistant principal for nine years, and then principal for the last 10, 10 years. So I've transitioned to really supporting um, school staff. Um, that includes teachers and school leaders in really providing quality education to our students, whether you're in the charter school world or um, the, the district school world, it doesn't matter as long as children are there. Now, I'd like to know a little bit about you. So if everyone in the chat right now can put the grades you teach or support or the subject you teach or support, that would be great. And then um, it's, it's, uh, Tuesday morning, I want you to share something that brings you joy just to learn a little bit more about you. You know, what brings me joy is spending time with my family and I love to dine out because it gives me a sense of relaxation and, and I love being served in that way. So that's my balance between work um, and that, that brings me joy. So in the chat, everybody, if you could talk back to me, just um, put your gr the grade you teach or support because you may not be a classroom teacher, you may be a paraprofessional, you may be a service provider, you may be a director, um, an administrator, it doesn't matter, just put the grades you um, support and share something that brings you joy. If you could place that in the chat now, I'd appreciate that. Board games, all right. Middle school power professional, sixth to eighth grade math teacher. Oh, good iced coffee. <laughs> I like hot coffee. Got to get my coffee. Okay, I see K to eight. Thank you. All right, sixth grade math. Oh, ICT kindergarten. Oh, I love kindergartners. Yeah, my school was K to five. I missed them. And then I taught grade six to eight. And then I was a high I was a high school teacher. So I've I, I've been through all the grades there. Yep. And I taught ICT when it used to be called least restrictive environment back in the 90s. Yep. All right. But yes, my kids bring me joy. Yeah, my kids are older now. So if you have younger children, please enjoy them because they bring you much joy. And maybe joy is not the best word when they get to, to the teenage years and you still love them to pieces, but you know, it comes with a whole lot more. 
All right, your kids and your pet traveling. That's a good one. Yeah. Sometimes you, you're in, um, in a workshop and sometimes your mind wander to a place that you'd love to be right now, right? So I, I don't want you all to wander to where you, you would love to travel to, but just think about the joys of teaching and educating our students. All right. Thank you for your responses. Um, at this time, I want to just... Um, um, share some norms. There are a number of norms on the screen, but the norms, my favorite norms that I like to emphasize, um, number one is the uh, being present, the idea of being um, present. Now, I know that you may be in your homes and sometimes there are distractions around, but I, I'd like everyone to be um 100% present. That means that you're responding, whether you're responding in the chat, on the note catcher, but it's interactive because you know what, in workshops, you can always get something that will help to improve your practice the next day, right? But that really depends on how um, focused and how present you choose to be. Also, I am very mindful of time, right? And um, and lastly, so we, we, we will start and we will end on time. And I always ask that folks look for something to take back. Um, in order to improve. So make sure that what you're using to let you, what you're learning today is really going to impact student because that's what it's really about. Um, as I said before, for those of you who are just joining, this is course D of a number of courses within the module supporting students with disabilities. So SOV offer these courses and I am the facilitator. They do take place on Mondays from 2.30 to 3.30. So what we're offering today at different times are courses D, E, and F. So if you'd like to take course A, B, and C, um, feel free to uh, sign up. If you're not interested in this topic um, only, but you would like to view, to explore and um, participate in other um, topics, um, please feel free um, to uh, sign on to uh, solve and we will share the QR co code at the end where you can scan and see many other workshops. All right, our agenda for today is um, what mindset support foster and inclusion across learning environments. So we're going to talk about mindsets. Why are inclusive uh, classrooms important when we're teaching across learning environments? Certainly, we want to understand mindsets that benefit inclusion. We're going to recognize the impact of inclusive practices towards equity in, in, in education. And then... Um, We'll talk about how to implement effective inclusive practices um, in classroom settings. So that's our agenda uh, for today. I want you to look at the screen. On the screen, um, Zaretta Hammond write, wrote, uh, wrote a book um, talking about um, inclusive environments, um, diversity, right, culturally responsive um, uh, teaching. And so I want everyone to just to look at the quote on the screen. Before you can leverage diversity as an asset in the classroom, you must reflect on the challenges that can interfere with open acceptance of students who are different from you. So just process that for a few moments. Let's just process that. Maybe pull out a word that um, jumps out at you. Um, and just try to process what is she really saying? And you can just write it in the chat. What, what resonates with you? What is she saying? What is she saying? Yes. Addressing biases. Yes, open acceptance stands out. Okay, the importance of reflection. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Natasha, Cindy. Thank you. Um, yes, Dolores, different, right. Um, we have to be aware of implicit biases. Oh, I have some smart scholars in the room today. So you guys kind of know what we're talking about today. 
All right. So um, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. We um, where she's um, heading with that. If we if we're going to um, leverage diversity um, as an asset in the classrooms, people talk about diverse. You know the diversity of our classrooms, but we we've got to look at the challenges that can interfere with acceptance of folks who are different because our differences is really what makes a diverse society, a di diverse classroom. And so in order to really, um, really use that as an, uh, uh, an asset or see that as an asset, then we've got to look at implicit bias, right? And so what is implicit bias? It, it's really, um, a, it's an unconscious bias or prejudice, which is really prejudices in favor of a, or against a particular um, thing or a person or a group when compared with another. So, but these biases are automatic or they're unintentional. Right. And, but they're very powerful because they affect our attitudes, they affect our decisions, and they affect our behavior. Right. Isn't that interesting that we have these biases with their, we have these prejudices, but they're automatically and intentionally affecting our attitudes towards different things and people, the decisions that we make, and um, our behaviors. So in the note catcher, what I'd like everyone to do is to describe how implicit bias can negatively impact inclusive learning environments, right? So I'm going to put that in the um, chat very quickly, the note catcher. I want everybody to copy that quickly. And when you, if you get it, if you got it in the, if you got the note catcher, just let me know. So I know it's there. There it is. All right. So um, please just let me know if you receive the note catcher. If you can see it. All right. And in there, please. Um, great, great. Thank you. Okay. So in the note catcher, please jot down um, just how implicit bias can negatively impact inclusive learning environments. And inclusive learning environments really is about places where students feel supported, right? They, they feel a sense of belonging, right? Um, this, is the, the, this is the classroom where we pay attention to students' preferences, their differences, and we embrace it all. We accommodate their, different, their, their differences, their limitations, right? If the question is, um, how can implicit bias negatively impact inclusive learning environments? And if, um, if when you're finished, can you just share that in the chat? You can share that in the chat. How can it negatively? And we talked about implicit biases, right? These are the prejudices that we have, right? That are automatic and they're, and they're unintentional, but they affect our attitudes. They affect our decisions. They affect our behaviors. And so the question is, how can they negatively impact inclusive environments where when we have a classroom filled um, with students of diverse backgrounds, languages, et cetera, right? Okay, it can make you unaware of why a student is shutting down, yes. They may not get, students may not receive the compassion, yes. Yes, it, it can prevent us from listening and trying to understand. Very, very good. Thank you very much. Yep, though that, that's correct. The student with the disability, yes. Um, I just missed that. Mm-hmm. Um, may not feel welcomed and accepted. Absolutely. Misconceptions. Yes, students can be mistreated. Absolutely, absolutely, right? And so we can have many biases. Even now as immigrant children are coming into our classroom, 
we have to be careful of our biases, right? And so that's what this workshop is really about, how to create inclusive learning environments. And we can't talk about that without talking about our biases. So how do we dismantle our biases? There are four ways we can it, um, dismantle our biases. Uh, it's through self-awareness, commitment, understanding, and implementation. I want to talk a little bit about that. And I want us to all listen carefully and take notes because we live in an uh, an area, for those of you who are in New York City, I don't know if you're beyond New York City, but certainly New York City classrooms can be very diverse, right? And so how do we dismantle our implicit biases? The first thing, we've got to be aware of those biases, which means that we are reflecting and evaluating right how we respond to situations to determine if it was appropriate and so we've got to be willing to accept right support and really um, um, in understanding our biases being aware of our our implicit biases and how those biases can um, impact um, the decisions that we're making about students, right? How we're perceiving students, our approaches to students. So being self-aware, self-awareness is very important. Um, being committed to being aware, right? So it's being committed to developing an awareness of our biases, right? So we've got to be willing to commit to learn, Right. Um, and, and so if because if we're not committed to learning, then it, it affects our um, self-awareness, our awareness of our bi biases. Right. So we've got to commit right to developing the, uh, our awareness of our biases. That's important. Um, we've got to be committed to understanding our own identity, our beliefs, right? Our backgrounds, our views, our practices, and how they differ from others, right? As um, the, the students that are sitting before us, how are our views, our values, right? Our beliefs, our practices, how are they different from the others around us, right? So we've got to we've got to we've got to understand the, the 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 differences, right? And so the next thing we've got to do is implement, which means to broaden our mindset to learn. Someone said being able to listen, just listening, understanding other cultures, other beliefs right? Um, um, other people's background, just seeking to understand, to broaden our mindset. So sometimes the limitations of our own experiences, our own backgrounds can um, create a wall or a block and therefore create biases towards individuals because we're not open to learning. So um, when we talk about the students in our classrooms, we want to think about who they are, what are their backgrounds, what are their cultures, right? And being aware of how theirs are different from ours and how those differences can create biases. So an inclusive learning environment is what we're after. And it's an environment where um, students feel accepted. It's it's an environment where students are accommodated, um, regardless of their disabilities, their Im impairments, and they are provided equity. They're able to learn, engage in learning in the same um, environment as, as general education uh, students. Right, and it's really about including them in that environment and making the necessary accommodations in order for them to thrive in those environments. So, in the note catcher, um, what I'd like you to just uh, write in the note catcher is what are some barriers and some benefits to inclusive learning environments? So, there are two columns there. I want you to move towards the last column of the uh, graphic organizer. And I want you to write, what are some barriers and some benefits, right? 
what are the, the possible barriers to inclusion um, uh, in classrooms and what are the benefits of inclusion in the classroom? So um, I'm going to put the note catcher in the chat again for those who are just um, joining. And I'd like you to just jot down some barriers and some benefits to inclusion in the classroom. Gonna give us a few few seconds to do that. Just think about just one barrier, one benefit to inclusion classrooms. This is the integration of general education students and special education students. And feel free to put it in the chat when you're finished. I'd like to hear from you or you can um, verbalize a benefit. Um, matter of fact, let's, let, let's start with the benefits. Anybody can think of a benefit of inclusive classrooms? I think inclusive classrooms allow um, the students to feel valued, whatever their disabilities are, they feel valued and confident okay. to share. Thank I've you. seen that, yes. Thank you. Anyone else, a benefit? Another benefit is uh, with my students, they feel safe. They know mm. that when they come into my classroom, no matter what kind of day they had, no matter what kind of environment they're coming from, our classroom is safe. They can, no one's going to make fun of them. They're going to get the support that they need if they need a timeout just to collect their thoughts for the day. Some of them are coming from, we're, I'm in Queens. Some of them are coming from the Bronx just to come to our school because they're displaced. Mm. They're spending hours on a bus. They get to school late, haven't eaten, and then there's no eating in the classroom. I'm not that teacher. Take the two minutes you need to eat. Take care of yourself so that you can come back to me and we can get this work done. Yes. But thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? We have time for one more share. Students, they feel that they're part of a community. I see that in the chat. Yeah. What? Um. One more benefit. Yeah, I've, I like the feeling safe feeling a sense of belonging, community, right? Exposure to general education and, spe and special education students, absolutely, right? Um, what about some barriers? What are some barriers to inclusive classrooms? Any barriers? You could just put that in the chat. One of the barriers that I uh, have noticed with some teachers is uh, discrimination. Mm. Um, I had a student one time and I absolutely adored him. And one of the other teachers was like, are you serious? That kid's never going to amount to nothing. All they do is cause problems. And I was mm. like, how do you talk about a student that way? Mm. They're children. Yes. They're it's children. Yeah. They're able to learn. If you just show them, even if it's just one teacher, that's all they need is one teacher. And it might not be that year. It might be the next year. You never know how you influence each and every student that comes through your classroom. Absolutely. Yes. So beliefs, mindsets, approaches, right? All of that. So it's not just the peers and it's not student to student, but it's also the teacher's belief system, the teacher's mindset and how that affects the environment that's created for students. Thank you very much, right? So when we thought, when we talk about inclusion, um, when we look at the history of inclusion, there are a number of students with disabilities that have been in, in that are in inclusive um, classroom env environments, right? Because the history shows that um, separate classrooms really don't allow for interaction between um, SWDs and general education students. And so what inclusion provides is that opportunity for students to learn together and it increases the achievement of students with disabilities, right? And uh, uh, um, 
a problem or a challenge sometimes is just general education teachers not having the training, but there's so many more benefits to it. And so the, the barriers or the challenges can be overcome when we understand the benefits of having, of being in that environment. What I'd like us to do now is I'm going to um, show this video um, and I want you to take a look at the video and um, kind of um, pull out how does this um, th this strategy, how does it what how does it resonate with you? You know, and I want us to think about a big word or a concept that um, she is really trying to teach here. Um, I think it's a very powerful uh, message that she sends to all um, classroom uh, teachers. So let's just take a listen. Hi, my name is Shelley Moore, and I'm a third year PhD student at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. As Canadians, we have a reputation for finding and embracing the strength in our diversity. This value, however, hasn't been reflected in our classrooms, which still segregates students by ability, especially students with developmental disabilities. There's a gap in our understanding about what we know inclusive education to be, philosophically, versus what we understand and the importance of understanding inclusion in our practice. This is the question I'm trying to answer in my research, is how can we find the value in the day-to-day -day practice in our classrooms in terms of inclusive education? So how am I going to explain this to you? Now I can sit here and try and describe this, or we can have a little bit more fun. Why don't we go bowling? So let's talk about bowling. You have 10 pins, you have two balls, and you have a lane. The goal is to knock down as many pins as you can. But if you don't get them all, it's okay because you have another chance. But when I bowl and roll the ball down the middle and I don't knock them all down, what often ends up happening to me is that there's two pins left standing on either end and they stare at you. It's the 7-10 split and it's the hardest shot in bowling. How is bowling like teaching? The ball was the lesson, the pins are the kids. We aim for the middle, we do the best we can, the pins that are left standing, we often have another chance to kind of get to them, but at the end of the day, those two pins that are staring looking at you are our kids who need the most support and our kids who need the most challenge. So we end up choosing one and the other one is left standing. I just took all the fun out of bowling. Now I don't know how many times you've watched professional bowling, but I spent an afternoon watching professional bowling and let me tell you, there was not one bowler who rolled that ball down the middle of the lane. They throw the ball down the lane at a curve. And I was actually really curious about this, so I called up a professional bowler. He was so excited. I don't think he gets a lot of calls about education. He said the reason why the ball has to enter at a curve is because you will knock down more pins and create a bigger domino effect if you enter at that angle. But in order to do that, you have to change your aim. In order to knock down the most pins with one shot, he aims for the pins that are the hardest to hit. Now let's just let this sink in for a second. We are taught to teach the head pins. We are not taught to teach to the kids who are the furthest and the hardest to get to. The kids with autism, the kids with Down syndrome. The part that's critical here, and it really aligns with universal design for learning, is that so often, the supports that we design for those kids on the outside of the lane are actually supports that all of the kids need. This is the part we need to understand if inclusive education is going to move forward in Canada. How can we find this value of diversity in our classrooms between the students? This is not just important for the outside pins, but it's critical for every single one of us. And just think, all we need to do is change our aim. Look how bowling changed education. Wow, isn't that powerful? So um, in, the, in the chat, what I'd like you to do is just to um, highlight or just write what resonated with you most? You know, what's her message? What message did you get? What's a big idea that you walk away with um, from this from this um, clip? Yes, so a hard hook. I want your statement. Aid, aim at the center to create a domino effect. Change your aim, right? Teach to those with the most need and all will benefit. Reaching the outside pins, changing your aim, yep. 
Yes. Yes. So the, the, the extra effort that you make in helping the one, then it will benefit others. And so if you can reflect on your classrooms and the students in your classrooms, reflect on your lessons this week and just see who did you aim at? What was the aim of your lesson? Which students did your did your re lesson really, really target? Were you were, were was it targeted towards the student who with uh, severe needs? What about the gifted students, right? But uh, oftentimes there, we have a tendency um, to teach right down the middle. Right, right down the middle. So this is an opportunity just to think about um, how we aimed, how we targeted our teaching and how many pins did we really um, hit? You know, because that's the idea. Everybody, when they teach, they want to make sure that students learn. That's the out, that's the end game, right? We want to make sure that students learn. And so we have 20 students. Some people have 12 students. Some may have eight or six. Some may have large classrooms. You have 32 students. So our aim is important. And how do we set up our aim? The way we plan our lessons. The way we plan our lessons. Um, I'm sorry. Let me just go back to my, my slide. I don't know what I did here. Give me one minute. All right. So in the in the meantime, um, what I want to talk about is um, the idea of um, co collaboration. And I want us to, in the chat while I find my slide, um, just let me hear your thoughts about collaboration. Just put that in the chat while I look for my slide. I don't know where it went here. All right, um, what is your idea about collaboration? What do you think of when you think about collaboration? All right. Collaboration, collaboration. All right. Get out of this. Okay. Okay. So when we talk about inclusive um, classroom supports, collaboration is huge. Working together, multiple perspective, gaining right benefits of this teamwork. Thank you. So when we're talking about inclusive um, classroom supports, we can't do that without talking about collaboration, co-teaching, power education, differentiation. There are a lot of terms, some of which you are already familiar, right? Um, learning from others, having a common goal. And so teacher collaboration is so important. I believe it's one of the most important component of teaching in or and providing quality education to students. Whether you're in an ICT setting on a great team, I think it's important to collaborate because when you're working, somebody says teamwork, you work together to understand the student's need. You work together to come up with effective instructional practices, um, building relationships in the, in the classroom with parents, promoting students' um, social and emotional well-being. That's done well when we are working together. And so there's some of you who may be in a co-teaching um, position and you see the benefits of, of co-teaching. And so it's about the minds coming together to plan. And so co-teaching is really about allowing students with disabilities to access the general education um, curriculum in an environment that, um, that, that is safe 
and that really promotes their social and emotional well-being, but it also provides for engagement, intellectual engagement, where they feel a sense of um, achievement and success because the design of the lesson is appropriate to their needs, right? And, 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 and we're accommodating in so many different ways. When we think about um, students with disabilities and providing in classrooms settings that are um, conducive for learning and will allow them to thrive. We can't do that without talking about the paraeducators, right? And so there are many of you who may be here today. My school, I started out with about 50 um, paraprofessionals overall, and my goal was for every paraprofessionals to understand the importance of their role in instruction in the classroom, providing supports to all students, management of the classroom, helping to ensure student engagement, helping to prepare materials, assisting with students' um, tasks to make sure that everyone was completing their tasks, really moving instruction in the classroom to ensure um, teaching and learning was happening happening for everybody. So it is so important for every person to understand their role in creating an environment that, that students will thrive in. All right. And so my mantra all the time was success for all achieved by all. So if we want to have successful classrooms, which means that um, students are successful um, and students can't be successful unless teachers and paraprofessionals are successful in their roles, right? And so when we talk about inclusive classrooms, we can't um, talk about inclusive classrooms without talking about that word. There's that word at the top of that quote. And um, this quote is by Carol Ann Tomlinson. She has been a master guru on differentiation. But take a look at um, the quote and just think about your classrooms this week, whether you are administrator, whether you're a family worker, a service provider, going in and out of classrooms or you're in that classroom. Take a look at what Carol Ann Tomlinson is saying about differentiation and think Think about one to three ways um, your classroom reflected um, what she's saying. She's saying differentiation is simply a teacher attending to the learning needs of a particular student or small group of students rather than teaching a class as though all individuals in it were basically alike. Right. And I and I think sometimes um, when you've been in the system, especially in the DOE for a long time, you may hear different practices or um, as teachers, there are things that are being pushed and emphasized and you wonder, you know, OK, this is something new. There's something again coming um, um that we have to do or a different approach. But I think all the time, we always have to look at the why behind it. What's the rationale? So as you look at Carol Ann's um, um, quote, the question is, what did, what did our classrooms look like? Did we teach like all the students are alike? Or do, did you find elements in your lesson plan and in its, in its execution that really attended to the learning needs of that student, these two students, the, those four students, right? And that's, the, that, that's what I want us to reflect on because that's the whole point of this workshop. It's really understanding the differences among students and how we are attending to those differences to ensure that learning takes place when they leave our classrooms each day. Someone was saying something? Thank you. I see your, I, I see your comments there. Thank you. All right. And so for those of you who already know what differentiation is, this may be a, just a review. Um, some of you may not be aware of the components of differentiation. So I'd like to kind of just share what we mean when we talk about differentiation. Somebody talked about assistive technology, multiple entry points, right? So they can access the, the learning, hands-on tasks, group work, yes. So when we talk about differentiation, there are four components, content, 
And when we think about content is really about what is being, what is, what is being learned process is how, right? And product is how they're demonstrating what they've learned and within what environment, right? What works for which groups of students? So what does our classroom setup look like? So when we think about content, um, we've got to think about the readiness levels of the students, right? In order to really be able to access this content and really be able to achieve our objective. Sometimes you look at the objective and you say, is this objective for all students in the classroom. In other words, at the end of this lesson, will all students be able to respond accurately to this objective? Will they be able to demonstrate understanding of it? And so we've got to look at those who may have the prerequisite skills, those who do not, right? And so we want to look at the what it is that we're asking them to engage with. Is it culturally responsive. So there are different things that we may think about when we think about content. When we talk about process now, it's real. this is where we talk about not only the readiness levels of the students, but their interests, right? How are we making helping them to make sense of what we're teaching? So whether you're a science, we're teaching science or um, it's reading or math or social studies, um, physical education, music, it doesn't matter. The question is, how are they processing that information? Are they visual learners? Are they auditory learners? Are they kinesthetic learners, right? Um, do they like to write? Can, are they verbal, right? How are we asking them to make sense of what it is that we're teaching. Are we just talking? Are there videos, right? Someone talked about um, audio books, right? What is the process for, th for their learning? How do we, how are we engaging them, right? And how we design the process really affects their level of intellectual engagement. And so, and then we look at how are we asking them to demonstrate their understanding? This is really key because this is where you measure really whether or not they got it. Did they understand it? And so how do you want them to demonstrate their understanding, right? Well, have you designed the tasks for them to express or demonstrate their understanding of what was learned? Right. And so definitely the learning environment, how many are best working in groups? Some may work in peers. Some may want some independent work time. Right. What about the timing? Do they need enough time? So all of these components really make up our thought um, process when we are designing lessons on a daily basis. And I always say that um, this is not just for inclusive classrooms, it's for every, every classroom when we're thinking about um, teaching and learning. And so as we've talked about inclusive practices, what I'd like us in the note catcher is just to highlight um, or um, place a, a line through the statement that do, does not right, or would not be considered an inclusive practice. So there are a couple of practices on the screen there. Um, labeling students with disability is an important part of inclusion. Focusing on student abilities and achievements and providing appropriate instruction is that um, considered an inclusive practice. Intentional development, intentional development and implementation of effective instructional practices, right, is that um, is that um, considered inclusive practice, right? Belief that effective inclusive practices are best practices for all students. So which one, um, which one, you could put the number in the chat, just put the number in the chat, which one would not be considered an inclusive practice? Which one would not be considered an inclusive practice? Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Yep. 
there we go, one in five, yes, right? So equitable, equitable instruction cannot occur in inclusion. Right. And labeling, labeling students with disabilities is really not an important part of of inclusion. It's really about understanding students differences, their needs, their strengths. Right. Because sometimes we think because students have certain needs, they don't have strengths. So it's about really understanding students strengths as well as their needs um, and really being able to provide instruction that will um, address both. Right. Um, as we um, think about um, inclusive classrooms and instruction, we can't do that without thinking about um, students' social, emotional um, well-being or and also the behavioral challenges that impact um, student learning. That's just being real, right? Um, and so um, functional behavior assessment is really, really important in addressing any barriers to providing um, in providing um, uh, quality instruction. So we want to make sure that we're able um, to do that, to address that. So these are, the uh, FBA is really about uh, information gathering, really understanding the, the behaviors. And then in order to figure out ways in which to, to address those behaviors, right? Um, and then we come up with a um, behavior intervention plan. And this is important because this is where everyone come together and consider specific ways in which to address the behaviors that we're seeing, right? That's, that, that's critically important. How do we address the behaviors that we are seeing? right what are some systems we can put in place what are some what are some rewards right what what teaching what modeling um needs to take place in order to understand right to understand um or to address rather the behaviors so um here's what i want us to think about as we come um to the close of 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 this workshop right um I want us to think about um, the connection between the way we think, because I know that some um, folks mentioned that earlier about some teachers' um, misconceptions or their perception of students will affect um, the way um, the way we 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 address them, the way we um, teach them, what we expect from them. On a, on a daily basis. So in the chat, I'd like you just to put, how does mindsets, how do mindsets, right, um, affect our approach to students? And give me just one mindset. And it could be a mindset about a particular child, right? It could be um, a mindset about a group of children. So if you can pinpoint um, a particular mindset um, or belief that impacts, that can impact uh, a teacher's approach to a particular group of students, um, um, please put that in the chat quickly. The folks, I've just admitted the three people in the room, but just know that the workshop is almost over. I'm not sure why you're joining this late, but it's now 9.49. So the three folks I just added into the room, the workshop is, is, is um, almost over. Okay. Predetermined mindset. Can you tell me some things that people, some mindsets people may have about children? Yes. Students with disabilities cannot learn. Yes. Yes. That they are unable to do, to achieve a, t a task that they, they don't understand. Yep. 
Yeah, and sometimes it's not even with just kids with disability, just kids in all, uh, um, in general, right? Um, if they're not, no, yes, if they're nonverbal, they can't communicate. It, assuming a group is not smart enough. Um, I'm not sure why you could not sign in because everyone everyone else signed in. I, I, I'm just not sure. Sometimes it may be the, the, the device. I'm not sure. All right. So thank you very much. So mindset, the orientation of our minds towards inclusion is really going to um, affect our self-efficacy, right? And, and that's why growth mindset is so important especially when you've been in the game for a very long time, right? And you've kind of have a certain mindset, like this is what I think, right? And this is my, this is my, this is my thinking and that's it, right? And so we, that's why it's important. We talk about um, implicit biases and implementation is being open to learning and understanding, right? Because the mindset really um, affects our belief about students. I believe students with disabilities can and should be taught alongside their peers, right? That, that, that's a belief, right? Um, that comes from a mindset that is geared towards inclusion with the understanding that I'm going to grow, I'm going to learn in order to do this well. I feel that I can effectively teach my students with disability, right? Learning new skills and, and trying new strategies is something that I'm committed to doing, right? And so that's, that's a belief, right? That's a belief. And that belief affect our practice, our practice. So our mindset and our belief um, of impacts what we do in the classroom, it, that's very powerful. That's why educators are so powerful. They're powerful people because you're literally shaping, right? The mind, right? And the behaviors of little people who are going to grow up into adults. And so the kind of classroom environment um, you create for them, um, the way we accommodate their limitations, our celebration of their strengths, and really um, catering and, and designing lessons towards those strengths, the interventions we put in place, our acceptance of their cultural differences, language differences, all of that, all of that really affects um, their lives um, um, overall. And their adults now you know, even celebrities will talk about their teachers, right? Those individuals who help to shape them, to shape their, 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 their minds, their thoughts, their belief systems, even in themselves, how they saw themselves, what they're able to do. So um, just know that it's very, very powerful. Our roles are very, very powerful. And that's why... Um, implicit biases are important to address in order to really um, a create inclusive classrooms. So um, this is it for today. This is our workshop for today. I want to thank everybody for um, joining um, this workshop. I hope it was helpful to you in thinking about those students that are in your classroom um, and thinking about yourself, reflecting on your own mindset, your belief, right? And your approach, your practices, right? How or who, what is our aim um, tomorrow? You know, um, that, that 710 strategy, right? Think about that when you're planning your lesson. At this time, I'm going to place the um, survey link. Um, if you could just kindly fill out this survey, um, we would appreciate it. And those of you who need um, the CTLE credits, important to do that. Make sure you um, also use your, your personal email addresses because Solved has been having difficulty um, with the DOE addresses. So there is the um, there is the survey. Thank you very much. Um, yes, this is the the whole idea is for us to really, really be fueled, right? To go back into the classroom, 
and to really do something different. And it doesn't have to be a major difference, but it could be just a difference in terms of how you function, right? The decisions you make about that particular child or that group of students, right? What, are, what is our thoughts, our beliefs about immigrant students? Because remember, biases are, are unintentional and they're automatic, right? And so self-awareness is really kind of bringing those things to the surface and really reflecting on how our beliefs, you know, our values can really impact the decisions that we're making without us even realizing it, right? And so what we're after is inclusive classrooms, understanding that all students can learn together. It's not easy, right? Because I'm not going to tell you it's easy um, to do, but it can be done. And that's why collaboration is so important. And for those teachers who are working in isolation, I say to you, like I say to the principals, stop. Like, don't work in isolation. It's not beneficial to you, and it's not be beneficial to the students. And I think that we can all agree that education, being in education, is um, is not easy, right? The, the, the tasks are greater. And I always say to my teachers, the key is to work smarter. And you cannot work smarter by working alone. So you've got to find someone um, who share your common goals, right? And have uh, uh, the skill set that can really help you to think and plan so you're not doing it all alone. Because when you when you do it by yourself, you're doing all of that thinking by yourself. You know, um, you're trying to figure it out by yourself. So when you work with someone else, um, and I think that's the other workshop, um, our last workshop, workshop F today, um, is really going to delve a little bit more into um, collaboration. And so I tell people, common planning, take advantage of it. So even if you're not a, um, a teacher of students with um, disabilities, it doesn't matter. Common plan, I tell my teachers all the time, take advantage of it, set an agenda, don't let it waste your time, but let it ma maximize the time. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, how do we start the lesson? How do we cater to this group? I have struggling students over here with this particular concept. They cannot they cannot infer. They're having difficulty um, finding the main idea. Fractions are diff difficult. How are you teaching it? Let me see your explicit instruction. Those are things you've got to collaborate. It's the smartest way to teach at this time. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. I'll be in the room um, if you have any questions. Um, just know that they're on the screen. If you scan that, um, you the QR code, you will see a number of workshops that are um, offered by uh, SOLVE if you need CTLE credits. So go ahead and scan that now and, and register for workshops. All right. And um, Solve is giving a $50 Amazon gift card to anyone who refers six New York City DOE staff members to any of our synchronous or asynchronous courses. Right. So you want to make sure that you take advantage of that. So make sure you sign up and then refer six people. So I'm going back to the QR code so that you can scan them and see um, what courses may be relevant to your needs. And I'm going to uh, strongly implore every teacher, whether you've been teaching for 20 years, right, or, or two months, it doesn't matter. Every paraprofessional, you have to learn in order to teach. So you have to keep learning in order to teach well. So the effectiveness of our teaching hinges on the, the amount of learning or the time we have set aside to engage in learning. And whether that learning is 15 minutes, whether it's an hour workshop, but the more information you're taking in, it really changes the lens through which you look at your students. And you get better at what you do because you find different approaches to the same problems. You find different approaches because the problems don't get go away. We always will have struggling students. We always will have students with behavioral problems. 
We always will have students um, who come in from different social um, um, backgrounds and have a number of emotional um, uh, needs. We, we're always going to have that. But how do we approach those children? How do we address them comes from the amount of learning that we're engaged in. All right. So thank you, everybody. And um, have a wonderful, wonderful day.